Okay. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Doing great. Thank you. Morning. All Happy right. Friday. I want to, anyone see the shirt I have on today? Sure, Bill, sure. Okay. Guys, first transaction paid back by the Market Center, second one by the Market Center, third one by Candace and I, and fourth one by Candace and I. Okay. We know it works. That's why we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. The market center knows it and they're willing to make investments in you and we know it and we're willing to make investments in you. So I'm going to ask you very, very kindly, you should be in the bold room. Okay. Lives are changed there. You start thinking totally differently about your, your world, your, 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 your goals, your business opportunities, everything. So at the very least, I want you to commit to being in the first day, first step to bold. Okay. That session is completely free. Okay. Um, did, did we have 10 people that um, posted their 50 additions to their database? How did that go for everybody? Does that motivate you? Should we use some other type of motivation for you guys? Motivates me to record my numbers. No, not record your numbers, but put up big numbers, like 50 people added to the database or 100 people it, a week added to the database. Motivated. It motivated me, Bill. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like it happened. So I'll be watching today um, as people are you know, finishing putting their, their stuff in there. But um, if you're not motivated by things like that, tell me what you're motivated by so we can push you, okay? I'm flexible. All right. Can everyone see my screen here? FHA loan contingency exhibit. I can see it. Okay, I wanna spend just a minute talking about this document. Remember, we're doing a contracts deep dive today. Um, I'm gonna to be catching up on all the YouTube pages uh, or all the YouTube videos um, here this morning. And yesterday we talked about the financing contingency uh, or the really the conventional uh, financing loan exhibit. And today we'll uh, spend a few minutes on the FHA loan exhibit, okay? so. Remember, an offer, for those that weren't here yesterday, to make it super simple, when you're putting together an offer, there's a few different components, okay? The first component is the pre-approval letter, pre-qualification letter. Do not have a relationship with the mortgage professional that the buyer is potentially using, or at least the one they're talking to right now. You need to call that lender and introduce yourself and ask for a loan worksheet so that everyone is aware of what the line item by line item costs are gonna be in both buying the home, that's stuff like title search, title insurance, closing fees, that kind of stuff, or financing the home, that's like origination fees, setting up the escrow accounts, paying the lender, all that stuff, okay? So everyone needs to be aware of what the cost to close are gonna be. The, uh, and you wanna make sure that you're not dealing with a dud on the other side. Because every once in a while, I find that the lender that my buyer is using is a duck. And I call the buyer and I say, hey, I called this guy and I haven't heard from him in four days. That's making me pretty nervous. Would you like me to explain what could happen if the deal falls through on their account? Because it's going to be costly. Would you like another referral? You see what I'm saying? So you need to make sure you're buddied up with that person, whoever it is. Okay. Next, um, we're going to put together the offer with a pre-qualification letter the purchase and sale agreement. Then you're gonna have what I would call the financing document. So that's either like VA, USDA, FHA, conventional, or an all cash exhibit. Something, one of those is gonna be in the contract for sure. Okay, and then the next kind of segment, if you will, is the disclosures. So seller's property disclosure, community, associ community association disclosure if applicable, and uh, lead-based paint disclosure if applicable. Okay. And not to get in the weeds. Yeah, like what, is, what is USDA? Um, what is the USDA? US I've, I've heard it before, but I thought it was just like a type of approval. I didn't know it was like an actual loan contingency. Um, it's a uh, it, it's a loan that's oftentimes used like out of the major metropolitan areas, like kind of way north, way west, way east, way south, right? And um, there's some uh, special financing for areas that are kind of. Um, oftentimes thought of as like more farmland or more like rural land. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I want to spend a few minutes on the FHA uh, exhibit today. Okay. 
Um, obviously, all exhibits need to be labeled properly and they should be matched between the purchase and sale that has um, um, <clears throat> that should be matched on page, what is it, six or seven of the purchase and sale agreement, the second to last page, where it tells you which, which exhibits are going to be included. Right. Obviously, it needs to be matched. Like, don't say it's FHA loan exhibit C on one page and B on the other page. Right. You're being evaluated, as is your client, when you submit an offer. If your offer's sloppy, they're going to think you're sloppy. And if they think you're sloppy, they ain't going to accept you. Make sense? So you want to have real tight, buttoned up offers. Okay. You do that by really studying how to do this and double checking and triple checking everything. Okay. Now, let's say it's exhibit A. Okay. Um, just as a sidebar, a lot of times um, we, we find ourselves in situations where it's like nothing's really happening until it's an emergency, right? So for example, let me use you, Donna, as an example, okay? You've got a buyer and let's just say your buyer is going to do a conventional loan, okay? And you pretty much have a good guess at who their lender is going to be. And you pretty much have a good guess of, you know, what type of loan they're going to get and roughly what the price range is and roughly when they want to close and all that stuff, right? So what's to say you can't start the offer right now, right? They probably first, should. Exactly. Get the purchase and sale agreement in there. Get the loan document in there. Get the disclosures in there, right? Put it all together and start filling out as much as you can. You know, all that stuff you got to do at the end with the KWRO1, it just takes forever, right? So why don't we do it ahead of time so when at nine o'clock, they tell you they want to write an offer, the offer takes five minutes to finish up rather than two hours. Make sense? Yep. So you could be preparing in that kind of way, right? I, I, used to, I used to have a system with my assistant where I'd leave the house. They told me that it was going to be, uh, that they wanted to put an offer in. I'd call my assistant and say, okay, it's an FHA loan. Put in the this step, this step, this step. It's going to close on this day. Send the comps in this way and have it all pulled up for me on my computer when I get home. So instead of going home and spending three hours dealing with all that stuff and missing another dinner, I spent five minutes dealing with it and then I went and had dinner. See what I'm saying? Can, can I add something else to that too? Yeah. So when you're doing your, um, your buyer brokerage um, agreement, you know, in your buyer consultation, you should probably include a copy of the purchase and sale agreement in that package so that the buyer can become familiar with that document way ahead of time too. Mm -hmm. So you're not having to spend a lot of time explaining that when it's time to put in an offer. Um, I, it's not something I did all that often, but I definitely agree with you, particularly somebody who's not done a lot of buying before. Now I would really, I know this sounds a little weird, but I probably would not do that with somebody who I didn't feel like I had a lot of control over, right? If, if I feel like they're flirting with other agents or they don't, particularly seem all that loyal to me, right? I might be a little bit more reluctant. Definitely when they sign the buyer brokerage agreement, I think they should get that stuff. But until then, I would probably, I would, I would not just say always do this or always never do this. I'd probably feel it out a little bit. Okay. Okay. So we're going to have our offer date. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that that's there. It matches on all the different contingencies and whatnot. Obviously put the property address here. More than likely on an FHA loan, they're only getting one loan. So you check box A here and the loan amount would be, in, in, generally speaking, 96.5% of the purchase price because the required minimum down payment for FHA is 3.5%. Okay. Generally, it's a 30-year term. The interest rate, um, I'm going to come back to in a second, the rate is generally fixed and institutional. We had a long diatribe about the interest rate yesterday. Um, and what, just to summarize it real fast, is this is not the interest rate that your client has been quoted. This is the maximum that it could go to without having the opportunity to leave the contract on account of that. So let me, let me translate that into English, okay? If, for example, I put 3% there and then the market moved and all of a sudden the, the rate, the, the prevailing rate is, let's say, three and a quarter, then I could go back as a buyer and say, hey, I can't get this 3% rate. So I get an opportunity to leave the contract on that account. I do not want that to happen to my seller if I'm on the seller side. So if I'm on the seller side, I don't want that to be like five or six or market, right? I want it to be way higher than the prevailing rate. 
because I don't want that buyer leaving the deal because the rate changed, right? If I'm the buyer, then I would generally put like three or three and a half, right? I'm trying to protect a, di a different person. Make sense? But this is not the rate that you're claiming to get. This is basically a protection line, okay? Most likely there's not gonna be a second loan, so you don't have to worry about that second part. Down here, we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of naming a lender here. And let me review those with you. There is absolutely no advantage to putting a lender there. All the advantages by leaving it blank. What that's basically saying is the, the person who is listed there, if there is somebody listed there, is the one who has to create the denial letter. So let's say they're working with Bank of America from the pre-approval stage, and then they go and get a uh, a, a, they worked it with SunTrust and SunTrust is going to deny them, that's not going to work because they put the Bank of America person here. If they had left it blank, they can get a denial letter from anybody. Okay. And just as a review, if, for example, um, it, it's probably more applicable explaining it the opposite way, like we did yesterday, where let's say they say they're going to get an, a, a conventional loan and then they go to FHA, it doesn't mean they can't do that let's say they have a conventional loan exhibit in the contract. It doesn't mean they can't go get an FHA loan. What it means is they're not protected with the contingency anymore. Make sense? So if they go and switch to an FHA loan, get a denial for an FHA loan, then they're not going to be able to leave the contract without penalty. The hey, way Taylor, to... if you're still within the finance contingency, do you have to make an amendment to change the, uh, the finance the finance or I was about how, to how I was about to go there. So th thanks for bringing that up. So um, you don't need to you do not need to you, you really don't need to alert the seller of, it, of that at all, right? If you're going from conventional to FHA, it's really none of their business. It's just a fact of the matter is uh, you're not protected with a contingency anymore, right? Now, had you said you were getting an FHA loan at the beginning, you probably wouldn't have been chosen. Right, or at least they would have probably preferred a conventional loan over FHA, generally just because it's a larger down payment. Right. So the the appropriate way to to, to discuss what you said, Marquia, is um, if you were to alert the seller, hey, we're moving to FHA financing. So we're going to do an amendment here that says, um, uh, you know, exhibit C with offer date, you know, June 3rd is now uh, the FHA loan, or the, I'm sorry, the conventional loan exhibit is no longer part of the contract. And all parties agree that the new exhibit C, which is the FHA loan is part of the contract and it's written in a way that would protect your seller, or I'm sorry, your buyer, then you're in the clear. But I'm not signing that, or I don't want my seller to have to sign that. Now, of course, a lot of agents aren't that great, right? So they may say, oh, no big deal. Right, and now they've allowed themselves a, uh, or they've allowed the other person an out. Okay, the summary of all this is it's a bit complicated until you get some experience. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're unsure or you want a quadruple check, just reach out to us. Okay. Um, so again, my recommendation would be leaving this piece blank. Okay. Now financing. This is the same exact financing contingency as as written in the other agreements as well. Okay. Generally, I would have said two years ago, this should be 21 to 25 days. Now it's probably more like 14, 15 days, maybe less. If somebody has already going, gone through the underwriting process and they essentially have a, a conditional approval, they're just waiting for the house, then that's something that you might be able to either way lower or just release altogether in an effort to win, right? If you don't, guys, remember, if you don't win, nothing else matters. You gotta win first. If you win, then you clear out the other people that were interested, and then you can deal with the headaches later on if there are any. Okay, but you got to win first. Okay, the biggest difference between FHA and a conventional loan exhibit is with the appraisal. Okay, so, so Bill, can I just clarify? You always want to talk to your lender first, though, to, to make sure that that's doable, right? What's doable? The financing contingency. Oh, period. yeah, absolutely. Hey, we're trying to win this, Mrs. Linder. Can you, is there anything that can be done? You know, the seller told me that they had like to see no financing contingency. How comfortable do you feel with that? Have you spoken to your borrower about the pros and cons of that? Are they completely aware of the risks? And then I'll ask, be asking them the same questions. Have you spoken to your lender about 
the risks of releasing this contingency? Yes, okay, then I think that's what we should do. Absolutely, okay. I um, remember you are, you are in charge. You are the choreographer of this entire transaction. There are gonna be many, many players. Your job is to make sure they all do their job. Make sense? So if you've got a weak link on the team, you might need to have a conversation with them. I helped a buddy buy a couple months ago and um, he had a crappy lender. It awful, awful. And I had to have a few conversations with him, actually like almost every day. And it was very, very painful. So um, you gotta make sure that your teammates are A players, okay? Um, the biggest difference between the appraisal contingency on a conventional loan and the appraisal contingency on an FHA loan is really twofold. Number one is there is a time deadline or a number of days with conventional. With FHA, it can go through the closing, right? You'll see here there's no length, there's no days for the um, right here the amendatory clause. This is where, where the uh, essentially where the appraisal contingency is. There's no number of days here. Okay, so that takes you through closing. So the day before closing, an FHA borrower could say, hey, the appraisal came in bad. We got to resort, we got to sort this out. Okay. That's another reason potentially why uh, a, a seller might choose a conventional loan over a FHA loan. Okay. The other big difference is that in an FHA loan, the because it is government backed. Right, the government has certain minimum standards for the types of properties that they issue FHA loans on, or it loans on, if you will, right? And those, generally speaking, are related to health and related to safety, okay? Let me list a couple of things that I have found to be problematic um, that the lender will, will identify, because the lender will come and say, hey, our opinion of value is this, and we have a few required repairs that you need to take care of prior to us funding this loan. Those repairs, again, generally safety or, or health related. So what I've seen there is obvious signs of water problems, like water leaks, right? Stains on the ceiling, you know, um, these kind of things. Um, obvious signs of mold, right? They're never gonna see mold that's like in a crawl space, you know, under, you know, like the inspector might find. They're not gonna look in that deep but they're looking for like obvious signs of mold, okay? They, they look for broken glass. So like if a window is broken, that's probably gonna be a problem, okay? They look for um, handrails is a big thing. So I have to look up the exact number. I think it's 33 or 34 inches. If it's if this like the step or the balcony or whatever is higher than that, it needs a handrail, okay? If there's missing handrails, that's gonna have to be dealt with before closing, okay? So um, those are generally speaking the main ones. Has everyone has anyone ever seen anything else that popped up? Okay. Um, all right, let's go back up to make sure we didn't miss anything here. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap that up in here in just a second. So here, again, you want to check in with the lender. Hey, how far have you gotten with this buyer? Have you seen their tax returns? Have you seen their pay stubs? Have you check to make sure their credit is appropriate, or do they just tell you that they have good credit and they make 80 grand a year, right? I want to know that the lender has gone through the details because I want to know if the file is going to be ugly or if it's going to be a slam dunk. Fair? So that no. means if they can't get um, through underwriting, if they can't get um, approved before the end of the financing contingency period, if they're going to get denied, they can get their earnest money back. If, if they're denied before. during the due, due or during the um, financing contingency, mm -hmm. then yes, they would get their money back. There, there's only one exception to that. Um, and this is, there's definitely a gray area here, which is uh, what I would call like self-sabotage, right? So for example, they change their mind and they say, ah, I don't really wanna buy this home. The due diligence period is over. Maybe I'll go lease a BMW and that'll throw my ratios off. And then um, that'll give me an opportunity to leave the contract. That's not allowed. So you can't like self-sabotage it. 
And the seller can ask for proof of conditional approval? Um, to tell you the truth, I need to look that up. That, that's actually one thing that's changed several times in the last few years in the contracts. I need to I need to verify that. I think there's also a difference between conventional and FHA. So I will do that research today. Okay. Um, uh, because that happened to me on um, my last buyer where we got really close to the deadline for the financing contingency period and the um, listing agent asked me to provide um, proof that my buyer uh, was conditionally approved. Okay, so here's it made me the really way. nervous because it came right down to the wire and I was really afraid about her losing her earnest money if the lender couldn't give me some kind of evidence at that point. All right, so let's read that. This is how it, this is what it is for FHA, okay? Number seven, right of seller to request evidence of buyer's ability to close. If the financing contingency ends without the buyer terminating this agreement, which means that everything just worked out, right? Seller shall have the right, but not the obligation to request that buyer provide seller with written evidence of buyer's financial ability to purchase the property. A copy of a loan commitment from each institutional lender from which the buyer is seeking mortgages, for example, if there was a second loan involved, to, um, to purchase the property, stating the type, amount, and terms of the loan and conditions to be funded I'm sorry, conditions to funding the loan that shall be deemed evidence or sufficient evidence. That's a conditional approval, like you just said. The provision of such evidence is not a guarantee that the mortgage loan will be funded or that the buyer will close on the property. Buyer shall have seven days from the seller, from the date the seller delivers, diver, ah, seven days from the date seller delivers notice to buyer requesting such evidence to produce the same. No request for such evidence shall be made by seller less than seven days from the date of closing. Okay, so that, that tells me there's only a very small window that they can ask for that. The window would be seven days from closing would be their end of their limit, and seven days from the financing contingency ending would be the beginning of their limit. So there's a very small window that they could do that. But there would never be a situation where you were expected to do that sooner than seven days from the end of the financing contingency. So I'll go back uh, later and read it exactly how it reads for conventional, but this is how it reads for FHA. Does that answer your question? Yes, I was just really worried about protecting the That was not a very money. confident, yes. Um, because, I, I don't know, I guess I'm just really clear on what needs to happen before the end of the financing contingency yeah, period to make sure that my buyer's money deposit is protected. Yes. Okay. Let, I, let, me, let me try to clarify that then. Okay. Um, more than likely, especially in today's market where these time periods are, are tend to be a little shorter, um, you are probably not going to be clear to close, almost certainly not going to be clear to close by the time the financing contingency ends. Remember, in a perfect world, the buyer would want the financing contingency to go all the way to, to closing. But in a, set, and in a perfect world for the seller, they wouldn't want a financing contingency. So the whole reason why we have some or have one and the rough number of days is because it's a negotiation between the parties, right? So under, understand that. Ideally, the buyer would have the whole time. Ideally, for the seller, they wouldn't have any. So this is kind of a meeting in the middle, if you will. Now, you are not almost certainly not going to have a full clear to close, full approval. But by the time that the financing contingency is almost, is about to expire, you wanna make sure that you're having enough conversations with the lender to say, hey, the financing contingency is ending on the fourth. So meaning if this deal is gonna die or if this loan's not gonna be approved, I need to know now and you need to issue me a letter now so I can deal with that prior to the end of the contingency period. So by the time the end of the contingency period is happening, we wanna make sure that there's been a conditional approval, which is generally likely gonna be the case, and that the, whatever the conditions are, are achievable. Meaning like, 
the buyer will have to furnish his most recent pay stub, or the buyer will supply us with insurance, or the buyer will explain this cash deposit or whatever, right? It's things that are, that are doable, right? But if the condition is, um, you know, the buyer will need 50 grand in closing money and they only have 30 grand in closing money, then that's going to be a problem. See what I'm saying? That's probably not going to be able to be dealt with, most likely. Okay. Okay. Great question, Sana. Don't say yes if you mean no now. Let's get let's let's make sure we get those answers done. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so we're going to go down here, and the next page is number eleven, or next section is number eleven. Um, what I generally put here, although I think Melba would probably disagree with me, is contract sales price. And the only reason why I would do that is because I don't want to have to change it ten times. So if it reads contract sales price, then that basically says the home must appraise for the contract sales price. Okay. Now. So you're saying don't put in a figure, put in contract sales price in case something changes. Like if there was an escalation clause or something, because that right. amount always needs to match what um, the purchase, the offer amount is, right? Well, it needs to match the ultimate binding contract sales price. Okay. Now, remember, this is just an offer when we're starting to fill this out, right? So for example, if I, let's say I put an offer in of 300,000 and I put 300,000 here and the seller counters me at 310 and ultimately we agree to 310, then I need to change this to 310. So I'm, is, this is probably not, I don't want to like disagree with Melba on camera. What, what is she suggesting? Well, I know Kathy Vitale said that you would need to, I guess, do an, it would need to be revised to match if the, um, if the sale price changed. You wanna always remember that you have that figure in there and make sure that it matches um, you know, the final sale price. Yeah, I don't remember I, how she said to do that, whether it was to re, you know, do a new FHA loan contingency or just do an amendment to the contract. I don't remember what she said. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, hopefully this doesn't bite me, but I'm gonna say put contract sales price. And if somebody later in the transaction wants it to read differently, then you just do an amendment. Okay, that way you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so what that means is that if the home appraises for contract sales price or more, you got no issue and the buyer needs to move forward. By the way, when you notify the seller of that, you don't send them the appraisal report and you don't tell them what it appraised for, right? You just say, we're good. Appraisal came in, everything's good. See it closing, right? What if they ask you what it appraised for? Then you say, <laughs> no. I'm not trying to be arrogant about it. You just say, my client is not, um, is not interested in sharing it. Okay. And on that note, if it comes in lower, do you provide them with a copy? Oh, of yeah, the yeah. We'll, we'll get there in one second. You have to do that. Okay. So if, if it appraises at list price, or I'm sorry, at contract price or higher, you, you have no issue and all the parties are continuing to move forward. Okay. At that point, the seller, or I'm sorry, the buyer is obligated to buy the home at that price, which is what they've already agreed to do. Right. Now, uh, uh, hopefully this goes without saying, but let's say the, the, um, Contract sales price is 300 and the home appraises for 310, they still pay 300. That's exactly why you don't share it, right? Because let's say the appraisal came in at 310 and I send the appraisal over to the seller and the, and the seller sees 310, it's worth 310, I sold it to you for three. And they start getting pissed off. We don't, we don't wanna do that, okay? Now, if it appraises on the nose, that's acceptable. If it appraises anything less than the contract sales price, then we have a couple of ways to, uh, to deal with that, okay? Um, the buyer will then, they'll start the process by doing the following. They will send the low appraisal to the agent, to the listing agent, okay? Uh, with a document called the amendment to reduce the sales price, okay? And they will re uh, amend or offer to amend the sales price to the appraisal value. So let's say it appraises for 290. So you'd send them the, the appraisal and you'd send them an amendment to reduce, it, to reduce sales price to 290, okay? Now, seller has a few options now that they've gotten the news, okay? Seller could say yes, 
we will do that, right? And then the price is amended to 290 and all the parties are moving forward, okay? And as a result, of course, the down payment will be slightly lower, the monthly payment will be slightly lower, the loan amount will be slightly lower, right? Because now they were willing to pay 300, bank thought it was only worth 290, seller vouched for it, so now the price is 290. Everyone with me? Okay, the other option is they say no. And no could, could look a few different ways. No could be no, I'm not lowering the price at all. Or no could be no, I'm unwilling to lower the price to 290, but I'll do it to 295 or something like that. If they say no, which is again, anything other than yes, I will do that exactly as written, then the buyer, assuming this happens before the end of the appraisal contingency, which for conventional is a number of days and for FHA is the whole time, okay? Um, if they say no, then the buyer can leave the deal and keep their earnest money, okay, if they want. They also have the opportunity to um, bring the difference in cash. Let me explain what that means, okay? So seller and buyer agree to pay 300. Bank comes in, the appraiser comes in and says it's worth 290, okay? So the way that that is going to have to be uh, financially dealt with is now, let's say it was a... Um, let's say it was an FHA loan, okay? 96.5% of that 290 is gonna come from the lender. 3.5% of that 290 is now gonna come from the buyer. Then 100% of the 290 to 300 is gonna come from the buyer, right? Because the buyer's only willing to make a 96.5% LTV loan on the appraisal value or the sales price, whichever is less, okay? because they want to make sure that you have still have the appropriate amount of equity. So again, if the appraisal comes in low, seller says no, you can leave the deal or you could bring the difference to the table. Okay. Now, when you're speaking about appraisals to your people, I'm going to, I'm going to encourage you to emphasize a couple of things. The first is um, that it's simply one person's opinion of value at that moment by the way, is somebody who is not interested in buying or selling the property, right? They're not personally attached to the home. So for example, if there's something very unique about the property and maybe it's hard to appraise, the appraisal came in low or something like that, but let's say your mom lives next door. And so that's a, that's a very unique house for you. Then you may be willing, you may value the home at more than a, somebody else doing their research. So if the appraisal comes in low, it's the, the takeaway here is it's not like it's, you know, my fault or the buyer's fault or anyone else's fault. It's just this guy thinks it's different. So we got a little hurdle. We just got to deal with the hurdle, right? So we want to, again, we're, we are basically every day calming emotions, really outside of like death and divorce, moving is like number three, I think. Okay. So we're generally not seeing the best of our people. Okay which means most times you have to take off your realtor hat and just let them vent every once in a while and then bring them back to what happens next. Just keep them on the route, okay? They go emotional, you go logical. If they go logical and they're like, no, I will not pay 231 for this house. I'm only paying 230. Yet this is the only house on the market and my mother lives next door, okay? If they're going logical, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to pay, you know, $121 a square foot, not $120 a square foot. No, I'm not doing this. And then you can bring them back to emotional. Do you remember how you told me how important it was that your grandkids could walk next door and hang out with their grandparents? Are we really going to let this go for $1,000? Right? If they go emotional, you go logical. If they go logical, you go emotional and bring them back to the motivation in the first place. You with me? Okay, um, does everyone understand how the appraisal contingency functions? Okay, um, next, mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance on an FHA loan is 1.75%, okay? And you have a choice here to check X box A or B. You generally would check uh, B, meaning it will be financed or lumped in kind of with the rest of the loan amount so that they can obtain financing. financing. Um, more often than not, if they're an FHA borrower, they're not going to pay it at closing because 
they want to borrow more money, but which is reasonable because the rates are so small or so low. Okay, so generally speaking, it should be uh, uh, B, but you, you can double check that with the lender. Okay, mortgage insurance, remember on an FHA loan, there's two mortgage insurances. There's the upfront mortgage insurance, which is what we're discussing here, right? Which is essentially foreclosure insurance, right? And there's ongoing monthly mortgage insurance. So that will be one of the line items in, um, uh, in, in the uh, loan worksheet, okay? All right, I think this is, I don't know why this is on here. It, I felt like it always confused people. Um, it says, seller shall pay the following lender fees. These costs are or are not included in any closing cost. This is just one line item of a, a possible closing cost, or it's not possible, it's definitely gonna be a closing cost, but it's stating here, is this a cost that can be included in a fee that the seller pays? I always check yes, or I always check the are included, okay? Next, this section, let's go back to lender required repairs for a second, because this is where it's relevant, okay? So when you're looking through this house, right, you're looking for the things we just discussed, health problems, safety problems, these kind of things, right? And so those are things that if the buyer is using an FHA loan, they will have to be addressed before the funding of the loan, meaning before the closing, right? So if the home has some of that stuff, then I would probably put are to be paid by seller up to, you know, maybe a thousand bucks or 2000 bucks or something like that, okay? What that means is that if the lender comes back and says, you've got to address these couple things here, then the seller will pay up to that amount. And beyond that amount, it goes back to being negotiated, okay? If the home is in great condition and you don't expect there to be any issues, then you could just put, seller and I would put like 500 or something like that, just in case something popped up, okay? You could also, if you wanted your FHA offer to be more appealing, you could also put zero there. And therefore, if there was any, any lender required repairs, you would pay them as the buyer. That's also allowed, okay? Okay, if the home is not on public sewer, but it's close to public sewer, I have to look up exactly what the distance is. I think it's like a hundred feet or something. Um, then the FHA loan may, I've never seen this happen, but they, they could potentially say you must hook up to the sewer, which is incredibly expensive. Okay. So I've always put here, um, uh, I, most of the time, most all the, most all the properties I ever dealt with were sept or were sewer anyway, not septic, but um, I would click seller agrees to pay the cost not to exceed, I might put like five grand or something there. Now, if the home's already on sewer, that's, that clause is irrelevant, okay? And then section 20 is this is an arm's length transaction or this is not an arm's length transaction, right? So if, you know, Uncle Joe is selling it to, you know, nephew George, a $300,000 house for 200,000, that's a not arm's length transaction. If it's just a normal, uh, you know, regular old sale, then it is, okay? And there's sections for the parties to sign with their name, with their, uh, um, what do you call it? Signature, with their real realtor organization and all that, okay? Now, remember a couple, couple of kind of contract tips real fast. Number one is remember, especially in this, in this time, what a seller is looking for, in my opinion, is great terms, a clean contract, and a great agent on the other side, right? We all know that, I hate to say this, but I, I found that I said it like three times yesterday. The best realtor in the transaction is going to do more than their fair share of the work. You just got to get comfortable with that, okay? Most I, I found myself, I'm not trying to be braggy or anything, but I found myself oftentimes the best agent in the transaction. And so I did all my job and probably half of their job and I dragged them and, the, and their client to the closing table. But you know what? My client got taken care of. So I didn't care. Just get used to doing more than your fair share. Okay. You may have to call them. Hey, we got this yet? Hey, 
what about this? Hey, don't forget this. See what I'm saying? Okay, if there's extra stipulation or extra signature pages, like if there's a third seller or fourth seller or something like that, you check this box here. Um, what I was trying to say is they want it to be made easy. So for example, if you ask the other agent, well, what is your you know, realtor membership? And I'll just, you know, I'll just add that to the contract. So, you know, just save us a few minutes or save you a few minutes, right? You know, what, what is your, um, uh, you know, fax number or whatever, right? So the most you can do to help the other party, the better your offer is going to look. Literally, I'll look at that, that signature page and I can tell the kind of agent I'm working with just from the signature page. Okay. Um, this document does not have it, but it, this just thought just crossed my mind, which is I'm trying to think of what document definitely the purchase and sale, but I think there's one other as well that on the signature page, it has blanks for like the buyer's email and the buyer's address and the buyer's cell phone number and all that. That is none of their business. Take that off. Okay. Do not fill that in. The only place that that stuff should be is on the buyer's agency agreement or the seller's listing agreement. Okay. Obviously, because that's a contact point, right? That's the way that you give notice and receive notice from a con contractual standpoint, okay? Um, but in these other documents where it might ask for it, like the purchase and sale, clear that out. I do not want the other party calling my buyer. That's my job. There's my contact information. Don't you come near my buyer. Okay, now I feel like I've been like a tiny bit like assertive today. And I just wanna make sure that you guys know that oftentimes you have to do that because there are a lot of weak partners out there, okay? Whether it's another agent or another broker or your, the other client or the lender, or the appraisal or the home inspector, or the radon guy or the termite guy or whatever, right? And you gotta make sure for your sake, because you're gonna, you wanna get paid and your client's sake, that everything falls into place. So don't think that you 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 stay in your agent lane, but you also need to check in on all the other parties. And in my opinion, you can never do that too much. Okay. You don't need to call the the other agent every day or the lender every day. Hey, how's the Jones file? Just look for like the milestones, right? Financing contingency ending, appraisal happening, clear to close. How we doing on the closing? Everything good on the insurance? See what I'm saying? Do we have a conditional approval or not? Are the conditions of, uh, doable? All right, I feel like I've uh, I've been most most of the uh, lecture today. Has this been helpful, or do you have any remaining questions? Is Can I just ask a, a yeah. quick question about the sewer? Um, yeah public sewer connection. So you put in a dollar amount there saying that the seller will um, pay up to that amount. <clears throat> and they're agreeing to do that when they accept the offer. Uh, they're agreeing what, that they accept the offer, but I would never agree to that if I was on the seller side. So what if it costs more than what you put in there? Um, so the seller has the yeah. option to agree to do that or at that point, the contract uh, the buyer can walk away or the seller can end the deal if, if that was ever the case. Seller is not going to probably be able to end the deal. The seller doesn't have any of these contingencies. The buyer, this is something that could be activated as a function of the financing contingency. And truthfully, um, I never had that happen in hundreds and hundreds of transactions. Um, but what I would do is call the uh, lender and just say, hey, it's septic and FHA, what do we need to be concerned about? Okay, because sometimes septic and FHA needs to be looked at a little, the, the combination of those two needs to be studied just a bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the lender will be like, oh, don't worry about that. It's not gonna be a problem with this loan. Okay, so don't worry about it. Okay, so the lender has some insight into that. Whether Absolutely. It's a Absolutely. Okay. Like I, I did have it come close one time where um, this person was buying like on a main street and it had sewer um, and there was sewer in the ground or mm -hmm. in the in the street. 
but it was determined to be far enough away. So they didn't have to go through the trouble of connecting. Right. I had one in Woodstock where it was septic and there was public sewer in the neighborhood, in the subdivision. So I was concerned about that. And I wouldn't want to put a number that's so yeah. high in there that it's going to um, keep the seller from accepting the offer. That's well, I got to tell you, in this type of environment, FHA loans are not particularly appealing. Or let me rephrase that remember they're always choosing generally between two almost 100 percent of the time they're going to choose the conventional loan if the terms are similar right over the fha loan but if one deal is an fha loan and there ain't another deal then you probably want to try to work with that person right and again the only reason why i would say that they're not as appealing is because there's more hiccups right it's generally a little bit more of a conservative appraisal the, the uh, appraiser is looking for required repairs that a conventional lender is not going to care about. Okay, it's less money down. So oftentimes the seller might say, hey, uh, I'm worried about this guy putting it all together, right? Um, so especially in this environment, I would ask the lender, hey, is there any other type of financing this guy can get? Okay. So can I ask you to speak to this really quickly? When you're the listing agent, is that something that your seller is supposed to actually consider the type of the loan or is that kind of dangerous territory? Because I was told that that should, the type of loan should not come up. Who, they, who told you that in real estate school? No, mentors. Um, your, you, wait, let me make sure I heard that right. You're saying that the seller should not be looking at the type of loan that the buyer is planning to get? That's a non-factor? Like we should not be saying, hey, um, let's pick this conventional loan instead of the FHA. Um, yes, that's what I was told by my KW mentors. Okay, so I'm going to pick that apart for a second. Um, because I guess it's like a... There may be certain types of buyers yeah, that it, it could are be more likely to get fair housing issues and these kind of yes. things. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Um, here's what I would say to that. I wouldn't say, I think we should do this. I might say that at the end, but there's a lot of things I would say first, which is let's talk about the conventional loan process. Let's talk about the FHA loan process. So here are the hurdles that we will have to deal with here. And here are the hurdles that we have to deal with here. Stating facts. Okay. So Mrs. Seller, which one, now that you know, and you add that to all their other terms, which one would you like to pursue? Um, if you're saying that the loan type and loan terms are a non-factor of the sales contract, I think that's completely wrong. You do... Where it gets tricky, really tricky, and let's just let's just call it what it is, okay? If you get an offer for 210 with an FHA buyer that is a person of color, and you get an offer of 200 with a conventional loan that's white, and you pick the 200 offer, and that deal closes, and the a person over here sees that that happened, you better have a tight file to show that there wasn't something funny going on. So yes, people can and should get upset at certain things. That's very tricky. So maybe I misstated it. Maybe what, what I was told is we can consider it, but we can't say that that was the reason why we picked one loan, one um, offer over another because yep. one was conventional and one was FHA. Um, we can consider it, we just can't. I don't know if I, I agree with not that. Not to say that. Um, I'm not sure I agree with that because what if every other term is identical? I don't know, I, 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 let me just put it this way. If your client is going to accept a lower net offer over a higher net offer and the loan type or the person's name or the person, whether they're a person of color or not is involved, you better have a real, you better have something in writing from your seller saying exactly the reason why they chose to take this loan, 
or take this file. Because yeah, I think if anyone were to ever come back to you and say, hey, this guy, I had an offer at 215 and you sold it to this guy for 200. This guy's white, this guy's a person of color. You have some explaining to do. They are absolutely right. And they should make a, deal, a big deal about it. Your seller is going to have to justify that decision. And you're going to have to justify how they justify that. That's where it gets tricky. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I think it, it could be anything. Um, I, I, actually status. Happen, I actually had this one well, happen, sort of. Um, we had a, it, was a, it was a place in Kennesaw, it was a townhome in Kennesaw. It was listed for 125. These were this was a long time ago. Okay. 125 got multiple offers. We accepted an offer of 130. Okay. And we had a person of color that submitted an offer for one. Uh what was the deal? No, I think there's a person of color that submitted an offer for above list price. I think it was 130, maybe. And then we had another person that submitted an offer of like 132. Okay. And so we we took the one that was higher. Okay. I mean, we should be able to do that right now, when you put it under contract in the system, it doesn't show, of course, what the final sales price is. It just shows the list price. Right. So when we put it pending, it said 125. So meanwhile, this, this woman who had submitted an offer above that, who happened to be a person of color said, Hey, you, you, how did this happen? You went under contract for 125 and I sent an, sent an offer for 130? I said, no, 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 ma'am. That's not the final sales price. That just indicates that the home is under contract. I said, um, and, and she basically accused me and my, my client of you know, um, uh, uh, fair housing issues. But I, I, I had the data together that says, hey, this is what you proposed and this is what somebody else proposed and this is better. And when this deal closes, if you want to see that information, I'll share it with you, right? It's very tricky. It is very tricky. So if your client's going to do anything um, that it, when all those factors are present, I would, I would want something in writing explaining why they chose that. Something and including um, my, my real estate agent explained the pros and cons of all the scenarios. And I followed, uh, I made a decision independent of their recommendation. All right, now I know I'm, this is a, this is a hard conversation to have in front of a, you know, in front of a group. Does anyone think I said anything inappropriate? Not at all. Okay. And I think it, as I was saying, I think it could apply to other situations um, besides color. It could be familial status or, or yeah, anything. Yeah, whether the person is um, homosexual or heterosexual, whether the person is, you know. Uh, single mom with, with kids, single yeah, dad with that. kids, no kids. Right, old, young. Disabled. It could be anything. That's 100% right. Um, we're, every, it seems like every day we are getting to be um, in a place where more people can get offended by more things, right? And that's not a political statement. It's just reality. So be careful. Okay. Um, Ryan, did I, did you have a question a second ago? No, I just, okay. I thought, I thought saying uh, that it was helpful to, uh, to, to hear like uh, all the, you forget I mean, even if you've gone through these contracts and before, you forget all those little details. But that's right. And um, one little detail could be very costly. Um, I only had one buyer ever lose earnest money, and he blatantly deserved to lose the earnest money, right? And he admitted it. He's like, "I I am backing out of this deal, and I know I'm going to have penalties, and I know I'm wrong, but I'm doing it anyway," right? Um, I never lost earnest money for any other client. Okay. All right. A um, couple things. I posted a uh, thing in the chat recently about the business planning clinic. I believe it's on the 21st and 22nd of October. Um, that is with Gene Rivers. That is free. 
Um, it's going to be broadcast both on the Pivot Shift group on uh, Facebook and the uh, KW Connect. So I'd like for you to get that onto your calendar. And um, I will be posting the week at a glance for this upcoming week here momentarily. And um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, and that, but that business cl planning clinic, like what? What is that? Is like there's like setting up the four one one for the next year, or is it like I mean I I just don't I mean two days is a lot. I just wasn't sure exactly like what it was. Is it for teams? Is it for each agent? Like I don't. It was hard to get any information. Yeah, yeah. It's for for any agent, any experience, production levels. Um, you're gonna go through. You're gonna get like in the weeds with all the models, right? So there's gonna be going into a lot of detail about the economic model, which is essentially. You know, how many units do I want? Which my average sales price? Which uh, what is my average commission? Um, how many units do I need to sell in order to hit that goal? Therefore, how many appointments and how many contacts you're going to go through the weeds and all that. The next thing you're probably going to do is talk about the lead gen model, right? What are all the different ways to lead generate and how do you keep track of all that stuff, right? Then we're probably going to do some talk on the budget model. Um, uh, you know, it's getting ready to be tax time. Are you keeping track of all of your the money coming in and all the money leaving, right? And all the money that you spend in support of your business, right? If you go buy a book for 10 bucks and it's a business book, then that counts, right? If you take a, a client out for coffee, that counts. I'm not a CPA, of course, but um, I, I have a rough idea of what, what is considered um, uh, uh, a business expense, right? If you, if you take bold, that's a business expense. That's education, right? If you could fly out to Austin for a convention, that should that is deductible, right? So you're keeping track of all that. Um, there'll be some talk on the organizational model, right? Um, hey, looks like we have a big business here, lots of jobs, who's doing all these jobs, right? And giving you some kind of forecasting and hey, here's where I'll likely do this step. Here's where I'll likely do that step. Um, we'll probably talk a good bit about the GPS and the four on one. Um, and I would suspect that Gene will wanna talk about uh, calendar as well. Um, I've actually explained my calendar system to a number of people in the last few days, it seems like. Um, this is a good time to really make sure that your time is respected as much as it's valued. So as a full-time, you know, nose to the grindstone worker, you're probably worth about three to $400 an hour. Okay, if you find yourself doing work that you could pay somebody else $15 an hour for or less, that's a good indication that that should not be your job, okay? And you, you have to start thinking like a business owner, right? So I, a good example is cutting the grass, okay? I, I'm, in the work that I'm doing, I'm, I'm definitely worth more than $20 an hour. I can pay the guy that cuts the grass $20 an hour and I don't enjoy it. And I don't even have the tools. So that's gonna be his job, make sense? And during that time, I'm either going to hang out with my family or going to do something to support my business, right? Where I will get either more fulfillment than $20 or make more than $20. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, all right, guys, have a wonderful day. I appreciate you hanging in there with me today. Hopefully this was um, uh, uh, very helpful. And if you have any questions or want to ask anything offline, uh, you know how to reach us. We'll talk soon.